Welcome back to the Dr. Doug Show, your resource for bone health, hormone optimization, and health spend. So recently, we've been adding some impact to our training program that our, our full service patients are going through. And we were really focusing on muscle growth, and that's great, and we do need that. But what we found as we've been watching people over the last several years go through our bone health program is that the people that are doing some sort of impact, providing some sort of stimulus to generate bone, are doing better than those that are really just focusing on resistance training. So we find that you really need to do one of these three things. You either need to do actual impact, that's what we're gonna talk about today. So some kind of real impact training, or some kind of simulated impact training for those that are afraid or really just unable to do impact training because of the severity of their osteoporosis, risk of injury, fracture, et cetera. So there are some simulated forms like osteogenic loading, like OsteoStrong or biodensity or whole body vibration, like through a power plate or some kind of device like that. Those are simulated though, and they do work. But impact training, like we're gonna talk about today, through something as simple as a heel drop. Impact training is absolutely free can be done anywhere, can be done by almost anyone. Again, you got to be careful. Know what your starting point is. We'll talk about kind of some restrictions there in the end. If you haven't already, please click that subscribe button. We know that the more people that subscribe, the more people that are exposed to this content and the more people we can help with their bone health. So do that for me and the others that are looking for these answers. All right, let's get into it. All right, so we're gonna go through five different studies here and they're gonna show some different things. When I when people ask me about heel drops, the challenge I had initially is that I would see people performing heel drops and you see them performed in lots of different ways, all right? And so you can see people that are sort of like barely getting their heels off the ground and kind of coming down softly. And if you don't even know what I'm talking about, a heel drop basically is where you push up onto your toes and then you drop your heels onto the ground. And you can do this in, again, so many different ways. You could have your knees completely locked out and straight. You could have them slightly bent. You can come down with bent knees. All of the variations are going to significantly impact the way that this movement generates impact. But what we really wanna know here, and the whole purpose of this video, is to find out, are there studies that support using heel drops? Because it's a very popular thing to do, because again, it's free, it's easy. Is there a study that supports using heel drops? And how much body weight or multiples of body weight, which you've heard me talk about before. How many multiples of body weight can you actually generate doing a heel drop? All right, let's get into this first study. So this first study is relatively recent from 2021. And like most of the studies we'll talk about today, not a lot of people in the study, 20 individual, 20 participants. The reason why that's true is that there's just not a lot of money to be made from doing impact training, right? Nobody's going to make any money from heel drops. But we have enough data here, I think, to show what we want to show. So this first study is asking the question, can we generate enough multiples of body weight to provoke a stimulus in bone, to provoke the bone to want to grow more bone? And we know that there is threshold that's been established in the literature somewhere around three multiples of body weight. Some would say more, some would say less, but let's just call it three. Can a heel drop generate greater than three multiples of body weight? So what they did is they put these participants on a force plate and they had them perform a heel drop. And what they found is that they were able to generate 4.9 multiples of body weight. Wow, that surprised me. Actually, that's a lot more than I would have thought. Now, there was obviously some variability, but the reliability was pretty good. So they could, they could reliably generate over three multiples of body weight, which should actually provoke a stimulus of the bone to make more bone. So this lays the groundwork to say, yeah, this is probably something that we should be recommending, but how good is it actually, and will it actually play out over time if somebody does this exercise? But we have more studies. So the second study was even smaller in number. So it had 14 individuals and it was published in 2019. The purpose of this study was to look at heel drops compared to other types of impact training. So very specifically, they did counter movement jumps, box drops, heel drops, and then stamping or stomping. They call it stamping. I would call it stomping. And so I like this because now we can get a sense like which one's really better. So let me just describe all these things. So a counter movement jump is very specifically a type of jump where you start on the ground, you jump up into the air, and then you land back on your feet. So again, lots of variables there, how high you can jump, how much you weigh, how you land, etc. But the goal there is actually not to provoke a lot of impact, but it is something that you could alter to potentially create more impact depending on how you want to do it. 
box drops are literally just sort of stepping off of a box of a variable height. Now, this is something you need to be very careful with depending on your starting point. And it, again, depending on how you land. So their goal here was just simply to compare these four different exercises and they were using acceleration. It's kind of a way to measure force. When you look at the, the whole body vibration place, they talk about acceleration, they talk about it in Gs. And so one G would be the amount of, of acceleration, which is one gravity on earth. And so you can talk about Gs as in, you know, how much gravity compared to gravity, what uh, an acceleration looks like. These terms can be pretty confusing. All right, so from an acceleration perspective, they looked at this in a number of different ways. And again, the, these numbers can be pretty confusing, but it really looks like the box drops and the heel drops were the big time winners here. The box drops looked a little bit more impactful, no pun intended, from an acceleration perspective, but you can imagine if you're measuring acceleration coming off of a box, you're gonna get that free fall moment, although short. So I would imagine that it would likely have a higher acceleration than a heel drop anyway. The question though is, what does this mean clinically? Are either of these going to be applicable to actually improve bone? And clearly one is gonna be safer than the other. A heel drop is somewhere, something that you're gonna have less potential risk for injury, right? So when it comes to the results of this study, it looks like the box drops and the heel drops were clear winners compared to the counter movement jump and the stamp. When comparing the box drops to the heel drops, the box drops had more acceleration. But again, the big picture here is which one can you do safely and which one is going to clinically impact bone development and growth. And so that's the next thing we need to look at. All right, so now we're going backwards in time a little bit. There's a 2011 study that I wanted to bring up. And this, I wish they had just done you know, one intervention, but this was a, they described it as a multi-component training program. Um, and so there were a lot of things happening here, but one of the things that they did do was heel drops. And so this was a study with 49 women over the course of eight months. Let me just walk you through what they did. So they did a 10 minute warm up, 15 minutes of some kind of weight bearing activity. And this was consisting of either moderate or high impact activities such as marching in place. So you can get that stamp in there. Um, and then they did stepping exercises at 120 beats per minute. So that's relatively quick. They were using a 15 centimeter high bench and then heel drops performed on a hard surface. And they were looking at additionally, I'm sorry, they also added muscular endurance exercises uh, that were performed either concentrically or eccentrically for about 10 minutes and 10 minutes of balance training with static and dynamic exercises and 10 minutes of agility training and five minutes of stretching. So kind of a lot of things. Now of all the things in there, which ones are going to be most impactful for bone? Clearly it's gonna be maybe the, the concentric and eccentric muscle, but really it's only the, the heel drops. So this is another example, kind of like the Liftmore trial where you have a bunch of stuff done together, including impact. All right, so then they wanted to compare bone density from the beginning to the end. So let's see what they did. All right, so they measured lots of different things. One of the things I liked that they measured was the ground reaction force. So again, this is another way to measure impact and they were measured it for all the different things. So they measured it for the um, heel drops, but also the other activities. And so let me just walk through these because I think this really helps. So the ground reaction force was 1.7 times for body weight marching. So 1.7 times you could get just marching 1.8 times for the movement up and down on the bench, and then 2.7 times for the heel drop. Now compare this to you know the last or the first study rather, where they were seeing three, four, five multiples of body weight. It's just a different way to measure it. But again, if we're starting to breach that three times, I think we're going to start seeing some impetus for bone. And indeed, in this study, they did show not only some other good things, like they had decreased uh, fat percentage, they had improved uh, grip strength um, uh, with hand grip, better postural sway, better strength on knee flexion. So all those leg exercises were working. But then they also increased bone mineral density at the femoral neck by 2.8%. So that's legit. You know, eight months, not a lot of training. This is again, is something that anybody could do at home. But it included impact. All right, thanks for listening to this. Sorry to interrupt, but if you haven't already gone through our Bone Foundations or Masterclass, I would strongly recommend starting with the Masterclass because it's where we put together how we treat our patients in our full service program, where we reverse osteoporosis every day into one place. It's free, you can ask questions, no brainer. Sign up in the description below if you're on YouTube. If you're listening to this on a podcast, then just go to drdouglucas.com and you can sign up for that there. If you've done that, consider the Bone Foundations course. It's the expanded version, 16 modules, associated workbook. Um, also get a free ebook uh, with that as well. 
Uh, again, also all free. So definitely take advantage of these resources. All right, our next study is this 2002 randomized control trial that looked at a couple of different things. And I'm not going to go through all the details here because I don't want to bore anybody. But basically what they showed here is that heel drops compared to other types of activity, and, and they did a nice job here of describing the heel drop. So they did 120 heel drop movements in a three to five minute period every day, and they followed people for two years. What was interesting here, they were trying to, to show the impact of a, a measuring device. So I'm not really interested in that. But what I do like about this is that they measured bone mineral density. They used different site-specific measurements. And overall, there was not a very big change from uh, person to person, from group to group. But what they noticed within the groups is that those that participated more saw better results, which would make sense. But what they also showed is that there were responders within the groups and that there were more responders in the heel drop group than there were in the other specific groups. So this actually is a really good example where the uh, there's a certain percentage of people that will respond. And this goes back to a statement that I make frequently, which is some people find reversing osteoporosis is easy. And in this study, these individuals were hopefully only using heel drops as their source, their, their intervention to improve their bone mineral density. We don't really know what else they were doing, but there was a large percentage of people that got better over the course of the two-year program. Uh, and then there's other people that didn't. So what we're finding in our program really supports this idea that if you provide the stimulus and you have all the other things in place, adequate nutrition, yeah, uh, you know, all the good, all the great lifestyle stuff, all the, you know, supplementation as needed based off of testing and potentially hormone optimization. If you're a candidate for that, if you put all those things in place and you provide a stimulus, you should grow bone. But what we're finding is that there are people that will be doing all the stimulus stuff, but not have the other things in place. And they're not going to grow bone because the bone is being stimulated, but there's nothing to grow bone with. Right. And so those are individuals that are going to do better in a program like ours, where we can, you know, show them what they need, show them what they're missing. And then the opposite's true as well. If you get people that are, you know, they're on HRT, they're eating a great diet, but they're sitting on the couch all day, they're also not going to grow bone. So just a, a, a kind of a, an interesting case example in a study where they showed that some people did great. If you took the group as a whole, there wasn't a difference, but within the group, there were people that did well. And, and that's going to, uh, again, vary on what their starting point is likely. All right, and then the last study I wanna show here is a 1995 12-month randomized control trial. Now, what I like about this study is, again, they used the heel drop as a uh, kind of isolated intervention. Now, they also attended a once a week exercise class, probably not gonna have a significant impact. And they did 50 heel drops a day at home. So we're gonna talk about how many we need to do. But 50 heel drops a day at home, again, followed them for 12 months. These were also done at home, not supervised. So there's probably going to be quite a bit of variability here. But the recommendation was, this was what they said exactly, raising the body weight onto the toes and then letting it drop to the floor, keeping the knees and the hips extended. And so clearly they're saying, you know, you're coming up on your toes and you're dropping down. Up on your toes, boom, dropping down. Uh, and again, they measured the force and it was a different way to measure force. So this gets really confusing. But the results were not as impressive as the other studies. In fact, they did not see a statistically significant increase in bone mineral density in the intervention group. Now you could say, well, darn it, it, does, it must not work. But what they did show is that, especially for people that were further out from menopause, that the, they were able to maintain bone density. And maintaining bone density, being six years out from menopause rather than losing, you know, that anticipated to the two to three percent per year in that age group, that's a that's kind of a win, you know. So this is something that again, there's very little downside. This study shows that potentially you're gonna maintain your bone rather than lose bone, which is better than losing bone for sure. Although for people that have osteoporosis, it's probably not all they're looking for. So then in conclusion, is a heel drop a good maneuver to use on a regular basis? I would say, yeah. If you have the capacity to rise up on your toes, drop onto your heels, can that generate enough multiples of body weight to build bone? It seems like it probably can. So I would recommend people to start slow. Some people probably need to start with shoes on. So they're, you know, padding it a little bit. That's how it's going to reduce the impact, literally. But work up to using bare feet. Do it on a hard floor. The harder the floor, the better. Rising all the way up, letting your weight drop, you know, using your, your knees and your back, keeping them extended, really coming in hard with your heels. You're going to generate three to four multiples of body weight that way. If you're uncomfortable doing this, worried about injury, strongly recommend working with a trainer. 
it would take one session for them to teach you how to do this. So you can definitely, you know, get some training on this, but this is going to add impact to anybody's program. It's totally free. So this is a no brainer and I hope you find that helpful. So remember you are created for greatness. So seek optimal, not average. Don't be afraid to be extraordinary because you are, and that's what it takes. All right. I'll see you in the next video.